I mentioned about um, the fact that children are, uh, are using statistics and experiments. Um, another way that we solve problems as scientists is to do what scientists call thought experiments. Um, thought experiments are when you try and consider a possibility and work out what would happen if that possibility actually were true. Um, and one of the things about having a scientific theory is that it doesn't just tell you what is or even what will be, it tells you what could be, what would be, the way that things would be if things were different. Um, and we think that children are doing the same thing, but when we, they do it, we call it pretending or making believe. And these are actually children in the Child Study Center, which is where we do all of our studies. So we come in and we do research with these children. And the children in, <coughs> in our Child Study Center have started playing a pretend game they call research. Um, and the way that you play research is that you take these clipboards and you take clipboards and then you put on name tags. And then one child will go to the other child and say, would you like to come and play games? We call it playing games. It's really research. I want to do some research with you. So we, as the researchers who, of course, come in with our clipboards and, uh, and, and uh, names, studying the way that the children pretend, now the children are studying us and figuring out what we're doing by pretending to be researchers. Um, one of the most dramatic, so we just take it for granted that children are spending an enormous amount of their time off in these crazed pretend worlds, but it's a big puzzle about why it is that children are pretending, and it's connected to another of these big philosophical questions, which is that why is it that we as adults find information and meaning in things like fiction or theater or things that aren't really true? So why is it, what can we learn from thinking about things that aren't true? One of the most dramatic examples of this is um, the phenomenon of imaginary friends, imaginary companions. Um, if you look at, at the, uh, the popular world, imaginary companions are often either kind of scary or else funny. That's the scary imaginary uh, uh, friends in The Shining and the funny ones in, uh, in Harvey. And people have often felt intuitively that there's something spooky, crazy genius about imaginary friends and imaginary companions. When you actually test, uh, go out and study imaginary companions, as um, Marjorie Taylor, a wonderful uh, uh, psychologist, did, what you discover is that, in fact, um, in fact, something like 70% of children have an imaginary companion, three and four-year-olds. Um, it's extremely common. And the children with imaginary companions aren't actually any, they certainly aren't any crazier than other children. In fact, they tend to be more socially competent than other children. Um, and if you look at things like IQ scores, they're not any brighter than other children either. But there is one interesting difference, which is that they're better at those theory of mind tests that I mentioned. Things like figuring out what people are thinking or wanting, like the broccoli and goldfish task and other kinds of tasks that are like that. So having an imaginary companion somehow seems to help you to figure out what's going on in other people's minds. Well, why would that be? Well, there's lots of good imaginary friend stories. We have one in my family that I think uh, might uh, give some clues about this. Um, my brother actually is a writer for The New Yorker, and he lives in literary Manhattan. And he had a three-year-old who had an imaginary companion. Her imaginary friend was called Charlie Ravioli. And the main thing about Charlie Ravioli was that he was too busy to play with her. So she would say things like, I bumped into Charlie Ravioli today, um, uh, but he had to run. And she would leave messages on an imaginary answering machine that said, uh, Charlie, it's Olivia, uh, could you get back to me? And then she would turn to her father and say, I always get his machine. Um, <laughs> now, of course, that's a funny story about a child living in literary uh, Manhattan. But what it suggests is that Olivia was exploring the space, the possibilities, about what it's like to have a friend in New York, the same way that Einstein is exploring the possibilities of what it would be like if a rocket were traveling at close to the speed of light. And what she's exploring is this very strange thing that if you had a friend in New York, you would never see him because he would be too busy. Um, uh, and we think that it's that kind of exploration of possibilities that's actually helping the children to understand the possibilities of other people's minds um, and actions. Uh, okay, 
So we think that uh, looking at children's pretend can also tell us something uh, about the nature of imagination.